Welcome back. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Wolf Ties, the Future of Series. My name is Olaf Marco. I'm partner at Wolf Ties in Vienna, and I have the pleasure of hosting this event. Throughout the Future of Series, we are looking at a wide variety of disruptive technologies and innovation in different industry sectors. The innovative format combines presentations from leading Wolf Ties lawyers on the one hand, with industry and business experts on the other. Each Future of events covers a wide variety of tech and industry topics that are shaping the markets of tomorrow and influencing modern society. Each event will be recorded and shared also on our social media channels as well as on our website. Our today's topic uh, is the future of sustainable data, as we call it. Uh, the untapped potential of data will fuel economic growth as we transition into the digital future. If we can ensure the ethical use of data and that all stakeholders benefit from value it creates, we will secure its positive effects for the generations to come. The future of sustainable data will thus look into a number of questions including data ownership and value, data control and governance, and trust in data. It is important to me to stress that the term data in this context does not only comprise personal data in the meaning of the uh, GDPR, but particularly also non-personal data such as machine and industrial data. Any sort of information, so to say, which will enable enterprises to derive useful insights for new goods and services. Before we jump into today's session, there are three housekeeping rules to remember. Each speaker is asked to limit his or her speech to 10 minutes, which is our format, and uh, we will display a virtual timeline counting backwards and indicating when the time is up. The Q&A session will take place at the end of our webinar after we have heard all presentations. We invite you to submit your questions um, in parallel um, to, the, to, the, to the speaker slots via our chat function at any time. So please do enjoy the webinar. And um, now the stage is those of our speakers, first of which um, will be Helmut uh, Leopold. Helmut Leopold has more than 30 years of management experience in the IT and communication technology market. Currently, he is with the AIT, the renowned Austrian Institute of Technology, where he heads the Center for Digital Safety and Security. In this role, he brings strong leadership and digitalization knowledge to the team. And acting as CTO, he was a key driver for the digitalization transformation also formerly of Telekom Austria and other very renowned uh, companies. In today's session, he is wearing the hat um, of uh, the chair of the Gaia X Hub Austria. And he will now talk on the digital sovereignty for a sustainable society and competitive economy through Gaia X. And we are very enthusiastic now to welcome Helmut um, and his speech. So please, Helmut, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this um, nice introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to your uh, very important session or concept. You're talking about data. And I would like in the next 10 minutes um, to highlight a little bit the even more traumatic situation what we have to deal with as citizen, as member of Europe, especially European uh, stakeholders, um, and also how we can bring our society and economy and we should into the future. And what Gaia X is, I guess many people in the audience now do not even yet have any kind of understanding about this term. So that's uh, the second hidden agenda to provide a better understanding of what GAIX is. Um, we are talking and we're in a situation now, started 30 years ago more or less, in the real digitalization, um, comprehensive digitalization process. So what does, does digitalization mean for me? 
Uh, for the moment, I think we can attest that 100% of all the human beings with all these smartphones and laptops and then and, and, uh, and PCs and so on, we have a nearly 100% connectivity um, in our uh, worldwide uh, population. Uh, everybody has some kind of digital end terminal. We can communicate each other. We are now in the process of connecting also all the machines in the world. Uh, so that's the keywords like industry 4.0 or Internet of Things and all this stuff. So we are in this process. It's not yet that mature level that we have in the in the personal um, connectivity domain, but it's it's happening. And we if we look to the big figures, we are now in one minute or one hour more data. We are producing more data than we did in the last centuries altogether. It's an unbelievable amount of data with all of us not only companies, individuals, organizations, we are producing a huge amount of data. So that's the starting point. The second important um, situation, what we have to confess is in the meanwhile, from a European point of view, European uh, economy point of view, industry point of view, but also from a European citizenship point of view. In the, in the, uh, cloud domain now, when we store the data somewhere uh, for economic reasons and for, for some other business values or, or added value for an end customer, for the moment I think we have seven big cloud providers in the world, um, six or five or six of them from the US, one from China and nobody else. So basically this huge amount of data what we are producing currently in the industrial world and in the private world, if we put it into the cloud, which is a very famous and noble concept, of course, is not at all in Europe, alongside with the non capability uh, of producing operating system and, and, and hardware chips, we have this an enormous dependability um, of high tech in Europe compared to the global situation. But today, let us focus on the data world. So this situation leads now to a decreasing economic development in the European landscape. We can measure this more or less in all the different indicators from business on the business level. So it's a big economical point, from an economical point of view and an important issue, but also from a security point of view. If we have a few uh, situation of, a mono, of monopoles in the world, which keep all our data, they have, of course, it's a big threat also on our sovereignty um, as individual human beings, as a state, as a nation, but also as an uh, economy altogether. So that's the problem statement. And the answer more or less is currently that the awareness, which is more currently driven by very much by the industry at the moment, together in close a relationship and cooperation with large um, policy maker and organizations like the European Commission um, from European point of view, but also by national administrations in all our member uh, membership countries uh, in Europe to do something against it. And in a nutshell, that's the vision of GaiaX, providing a new concept, a new model, a new method. I will come to it in a in a second to be able to come on the market again from a business point of view, offering services, but also from a data use point of view. So it's all about data. Uh, what do we have at the moment? We have everybody of us has his data on his hardware, mainly. Companies very often we do not trust the cloud, say I have my data in my cellar on, on a server. We have silos. We have silos in organizations, in human beings. Um, we start a little bit to share data. So we are talking about uh, bilateral agreements when we are looking to the financial community or to the to the lawyers. You have a lot of business to be done in creating contracts and all this stuff. So that's going on. But that's not yet the data market. What we are looking for in the world now is to create new marketplaces where somebody finds appropriate data what he needs to calculate with to combine with some other data with his own or with somebody else with easy transaction costs to identify the data, the cost of the data and to manage the data. But at the moment that's not feasible because everybody's owning his data and it takes a one year negotiation time to 
to to to to create a deal of for exchanging a data and for many reasons we even don't find the data we do not have access to the data so the next idea is to create a data market place so in the community it's called data spaces the marketplace where customers or, or stakeholders in the market have access to this marketplace have easy ways to find the appropriate data and also based on even small transaction costs um, without going in contact again with the data owner just to buy from the market this kind of data. So this kind of data marketplace is the big vision. So what is um, jeopardizing such kind of data sharing and data spaces? There are many stakeholders, a decentralized concept, there is no transparency, if I, who takes the data for what reason, there is no clarity, no understanding, no uh, ontology of what does data mean, what are the conditions around this data, there are no technical um, APIs, no internet faces that can uh, easy access but technically means to the data and of course there is not at all any kind of legal uh, clear legal understanding for each data transaction so that's the big challenge the big operators the big service providers which currently store all our data so if i just name amazon web service google and all the big ones they don't have the problem because they have all the data they can do everything they can share they can combine we have to trust them but we cannot control we cannot really um, intervene with them um, on specific business cases so that's the idea of GAIAX. So to describe now what GAIAX is, I start with what GAIAX is not. It's not a new service provider, a new cloud service provider. It's not a new open data initiative. Everybody has to give for free uh, to exchange the data. It's a concept and a technical platform, called like which is uh, offered currently by open source means by the stakeholders. So there's a European association, the I, um, which is currently producing software which is provided to the community in an open source manner so everybody can use it there is a clear concept and methodology of legal uh, mechanisms which are implemented sometimes in technology or in documents where all these concepts are um, already clarified and prepared that if some if they if stakeholders come together to create an, uh, a data space together and in addition to that, to do that, well, exactly what I'm doing right now, since this is such a disruptive concept and, and a lot of technical challenges to implement, to access such a data platform, but also from a legal and from a business point of view, even more to understand what's now the business case. Uh, if I provide my data for somebody, if I sell my data for somebody by microtransaction means and I get some data. So this kind of business understanding, business model discussion, discussion, um, IT level discussion. So how should I implement it? How can I access to this kind of new data services by technical means? For this reason, the initiative organized also so-called GAIA-X, national GAIA-X hubs. So we have now uh, 14, 15 um, such national GAIA-X hubs in 14 member states of uh, within Europe but also abroad, uh, Korea, Japan, and discussions also with the US are in place that these national hubs act like a kind of marketing dissemination, business development support initiative. So we have the pleasure here in Austria that uh, two ministers, uh, the ministers for climate, energy, innovation, mobility, and transport, the BMK on the one hand, but also the State Secretary for Digitalization, uh, both together finance the GAIA-X National Hub Austria, which is around now of 12 experts compromising the Austrian IT and data community, that we disseminate the information, what happens in, in Europe, help in the first glance, what's available by supporting materials from uh, legal material from technical concepts, from business models, best practice examples, down to IT solutions, which are available as open source, to enable now the growing of a new market. And everybody which is interested, I recommend everybody should be interested because it will be a new strategic, a new disruptive strategic element for everybody, for individuals, as private persons, but also for business actors. 
uh, to understand this transformation which is going on now to deal with data and to focus not on infrastructure uh, and not on own uh, just on the ownership of his own data but much more on sharing of data to create new solutions in a disruptive manner to the market we should start everybody should start to understand the concept and to understand also how to position himself from a private person to a business actor to a policy maker into this new worldwide and global initiative thank you very much for your attention i'm looking forward for necessary i guess so discussion Thank you very much, uh, Helmut, for this very insightful um, description of uh, Gaia X um, and uh, a new data market place that is uh, about to aspire on, 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 the, on the horizon. This is very interesting. Um, you mentioned as one of the, the issues jeopardizing currently um, the situation, um, the stakeholders um, and, and those who own data or allegedly own data. and this directly brings us, so to say, to, to our next uh, topic. Um, it is about data ownership and the question who should own data and what is fair in this respect. And I'm happy to um, now welcome my dear colleague Paulina Pomorski. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, also from my side. Hello, um, Sorry? Paulina is, is, a, is um, I'm just about to introduce you uh, <laughs> as, as, as <laughs> one of, uh, of the members of our IP and TMT um, team here in Vienna. Um, uh, Paulina uh, is focused on data protection and IT law, um, as well as on intellectual property and unfair competition law. Um, together with her, we are advising on data protection law in the uh, in, in, in different areas uh, and um, over quite um, a, a sizable number of years already. Um, Paulina also teaches um, courses on media and communication law at the University of Applied Sciences, and she's also admitted to the bar, not only in Austria, but also in, in New York. And um, now um, it is my pleasure to really hand over to you, Paulina, and uh, please uh, share your view on data ownership. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, Roland. <laughs> And again, hello also from my side. <clears throat> so as we all have heard and, and read, of course, um, data is the new oil. <laughs> um, this is, of course, uh, no wonder as uh, data is um, all the time around us um, in order to make um, facts which uh, surround us uh, comprehensible and especially measurable for us. Yeah. And um, even more with um, technology speeding up like the fastest miles of Mexico, uh, more uh, products um, are in fact uh, delivering such measurable information. Yeah, so we can, let's call them connected devices or smart devices. And um, this is of course also not only restricted to the um, consumer area, um, where we would think about like wearables, um, which measure uh, the health status um, through like a smartwatch, um, but also relates to um, business data of um, yeah of, of, of companies where they can, for example, um, watch their production cycle or the, the 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 use of their resources and so on. So. We understand there is an enormous uh, amount of data, as, uh, or as we as well already heard. And so um, the next question comes then up, um, who shall own it? And um, there may be various aspects where you can uh, could link uh, ownership to. So the, you could make a very general argument in favor of the user. Um, since it is um, his or her data, um, the, the user can again be like consumer or business um, consumer because it's his blood pressure which is uh, which is measured, or um, uh, the the uh, farmer uh, because it is his machine which uh, which um, generates the data. Yet, on the other hand, you could also uh, argue in favor of the service provider or the, the, the um, manufacturer 
as uh, as the ones who actually introduce the means to make uh, such measurement possible in the first place. Or maybe you could also um, say that, well, maybe they should all have uh, ownership, yeah? So like, like, it, uh, like in the concept of, um, uh, in, of in intellectual property, that um, everybody uh, who attribute it uh, to, um, to it uh, shall have uh, a part in it. And then the question comes up, yeah, do they have to have a share equally or maybe according to the attribution, uh, um, contributions to it? Or uh, one could simply link the ownership um, to a specific object, yeah? like, um, like, um, like a dimensioned uh, smartwatch, which then obviously would make the uh, user the owner of the data. So, as described, there are different act aspects to which the ownership could be linked to. And um, as a lawyer, um, I would then instantly, um, my instant next thought would be, okay, so let's look into the law and uh, whether there is some regulations about, on that. But, uh, well, is it? In, in, in fact, on, on, on the EU level, there are um, no um, specific re regulations uh, yet on, with respect to the data ownership. There are, of course, um, provisions and, uh, and laws dealing with uh, data or personal data, specifically like the GDPR, um, providing a, a framework on how to how to use it and under which conditions, but they do not touch upon the ownership as such. Um, does in practice that uh, it means that uh, it leaves uh, actually the the decision or, or the, 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 the determination uh, of who's the owner to the factual circumstances, meaning that like yeah, who's in fact in in position in the possession of the data, and uh, he is like seems like the owner. Um, or you can of course also um, regulate it uh, by. Um, civil law contracts, which is, of course, also um, usually, usually done, like we can uh, just think about in the consumer area about Facebook, uh, who has in their terms and conditions that all data generated by the users are uh, yeah, <laughs> owned by Facebook. And um, so will there be any change uh, uh, on the EU level? As uh, we know, there is this uh, digital strategy um, uh, agenda uh, on the EU level. So, and we all heard about the Data Act and Data Governance Act. So, we would think that um, there, this uh, this this uh, area would be regulated now. But in fact, uh, it is not regulated there. It only um, provides provision for fair access uh, and fair use of data, uh, data portability, and the means for it, the inter interoperability. Um, but in fact, it does not address a data ownership as such. It, it also, this is also seen um, for the fact that uh, it only refers to the data holder, so the Dateninhaber uh, in German. Yeah? So again, the person or the yeah, natural or legal person who is in the possession of the data uh, and not uh, the ownership as such. So, yeah, to, to sum this up, uh, this might actually lead to the question on the concept of uh, data ownership as such. Then, uh, in the end, does it really matter who owns the data when there are comprehensive regulations uh, in place, such as the Data Act, uh, mandating any anyway obligations to uh, allow other users um, how and, and 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 when and under what conditions to and to access and use, let's say, my data. So this is in, on purpose a very broad and uh, questions, uh, which hopefully will lead up to discussions later on. Thank you very much, Paulina. <clears throat> we understand um, that uh, despite uh, the, the sheer number of uh, existing and also new and draft um, legal acts on the European level, there is no unified uh, concept of ownership, so to say, in, in data yet, and it's also not determined um, that there shall be uh, one soon. Um, however, as a, as a matter of fact, um, there are data holders, um, stakeholders that uh, claim 
to have um, sort of exclusive rights to data they create or at least they um, are provided with by by data data subjects or by data those who, who generate uh, data by doing uh, something. Um, the draft data act of the European Union hopes to incentivize such data holders to create and share data by giving them a right to reasonable compensation, as it's called. Um, and it is my pleasure now to welcome Dominique Huebler. Um, he will take an economist's view on different approaches to what this term reasonable in, in reasonable compensation really means or, or how it can be approached. And um, I'm more than happy to have um, Dominic on, on, on this panel. Um, we have already had the, the opportunity to work uh, together um, in very interesting uh, cases. Um, Dominic is uh, an experienced uh, economist working on regulatory issues covering old data monopolies uh, like physical infrastructure uh, driven and, and, and new data mon monopolies, um, um, uh, data-driven monopolies, so to say. And um, together with Wolf Theis, uh, he recently worked on one of the first um, cases under Article 82 GDPR, which is about damages uh, for privacy breaches and how to calculate uh, non for non-material damages, so to say, uh, what's the what the economic value uh, of the harm caused to data subjects by data uh, privacy infringements could be. And this was really very, very interesting. Uh, and I'm now very much uh, looking forward to hear his thoughts um, on the reasonable um, compensation under the Draft Data Act. Um, Dominic, please, the floor is yours. So, uh, pleasure to be here. As, as Rhonda mentioned, we've worked together on this GDPR case and looked at how to value data in, in that context. And I've also got history working with others in both times where we've worked on old school monopoly infrastructure like rail. And today I'll try and bring the experience of those two projects together to try and find a way forward of what to do and um, how to encourage the data sharing. Um, that Helmut is uh, asking us all to, to strive for um, while we don't have a, a fixed concept of data ownership yet. So I think the, the starting point here is, is very clear. The, the European Commission, all European institutions are looking at um, increased data sharing. We want more sharing after we've spent a lot of time talking about less sharing and less sort of uh, data transfers under both the GDPR and the various REMS judgments. And I think from an economist's point of view, that makes a whole lot of sense, given that data is something that we call a non-rival good in principle. So if Roland is <clears throat> investigating data to make a car and I'm using the same data to uh, I don't know, create a, a rocket and those two aren't competing, then there is no harm in one of in both of us using the same data at the time at the same time. So to that extent, data is a little bit different from oil, where if Pauline is driven and used up the oil, then I can't use it to fuel my car anymore. Uh, so in in some ways that makes it easier to share data, but more often than not, we end up in a situation where data, while it can be used by different people, ends up being pretty much not non-rival in a commercial sense, in that the person who's asking to use my data is trying to use it for a relatively similar purpose. And even if that purpose may not be the exact same good, and in fact the data app sort of rules out using it for the exact same good, um, they may still be using it for something in, in what's called an aftermarket, where I'm also present. So let me use an example here. 
which is um, a, a good way to, to think about this aftermarket problem. So if I'm in the business of making cars, then I may also have an interest in making car parts. I may also have an interest in repair shops, and I may even have an interest in car insurance. Um, the Data Act basically tells me I need to provide data to competitors in aftermarkets, but not in the same product. So I think before we think about compensation, an important question becomes how much of this is the product? Is my product just the car, so to say, or does it also involve car parts, repair and insurance? And are these all excluded? Or do I need to provide my data to people who deal in car parts, repair and insurance? And just a disclaimer at this point, um, cars are a bit of a a questionable example here from the, the legal situation, I understand, because there is a separate regulation on car aftermarkets. But the the same sort of principles apply for whether this is smart TVs or any other sort of Internet of Things element. Cars is just one where it's very easy to think about it. So I shall keep using the example of cars throughout. Um, so just starting off, a Data Act requires me to give data to third parties in a wide range of situations, as I just mentioned, with one very significant exemption. If the party asking is a gatekeeper or pretty much anything to do with a gatekeeper under the Digital Markets Act, that's out of bounds. I never need to give them data. I also, I do need to give data to the data subject um, and I need to give data to third parties um, that the data subject nominates. So it, it's wide in that sense. But as Roland mentioned, there are some conditions under which um, I, can, I can limit giving the data to people that I'm generally obliged to give the data to. Um, one question here is it needs to be fair and non-discriminatory. And I can ask for compensation that needs to be reasonable. And sadly, reasonable is a very wide term here. That can mean one of many things. And the Data Act only provides guidance for a small number of, of subset questions here. If I give it to small and medium enterprise, then the only thing I can charge is the direct cost of preparing and handing over the data. So it'll probably be a few hours of analyst time to, to clean it and, and send it across. If I give it to the government during an emergency, I need to give it for free. If I need to give it to the government during the recovery or the prevention of an emergency, I give it for the direct cost plus a reasonable margin. We're back to this wonderful word of uh, reasonable. Um, and sort of beyond that, recital 46 of the data, the draft data act is actually quite optimistic that large companies will find an agreement um, on what reasonable means, which may be a bit optimistic if you think about how much competition in the, the aftermarkets is, is happening in that space. Um, so, thankfully, the Draft Data Act provides some uh, dispute settlement bodies to be enacted who will take care of such disputes. And it also provides a provision, a transparency provision in Article 9.4 that requires a data holder to document and demonstrate for what it's charging and why it's charging what it is charging. Which basically leaves us with a number of situations where a data holder is likely to be fairly unwilling to give away the data because it infringes on its ability to charge in the aftermarket um, what it wants to charge. And even in, in other cases where the data holder may be willing to, to give away the data, the data holder is required to demonstrate why the pricing that it is choosing is reasonable. So I think that means 
the data holder, the access seeker who may not agree with what the data holder is uh, putting up, and the settlement body, they all need to develop standards and theories of harm. One idea that's been touted there is to go by the, the FRAND principles, understand the essential patterns, but I understand there's a fair bit of discussion in the literature about how complicated it may get. So leaving that aside, because it doesn't fit into 10 minutes in any case, I'll just do a very quick look on what's being done in sort of traditional infrastructure on what you might be what you might be charging, what might be considered reasonable. Um, starting from the sort of most access seeker friendly, which is you have to give away the data for free, the sort of government in an emergency case, um, which is almost certainly not good economics because you're ignoring the, uh, uh, the cost of providing the data, making the, the data holder very much worse off. It still happens in some places. For example, that's the, the rules for the German Mobility Data Decree. Moving along one step, you could look at the short-run marginal cost, which is what's happening for the, the small and medium enterprises under the Data Act, and incidentally also what's being used for access seekers in the rail sector. That generally works best in places where the activity that you're seeking isn't actually competing with the data holders because otherwise the data holder is suffering more than just the the cost of providing the business uh, just the cost of providing the data um so if you were to interpret it in that way under the conditions and under the language of the data act that's almost certainly going to be controversial which then leads you to various ways of thinking about what kind of margin you should charge and who should pay for the margin, where again, you can look at a couple of provisions from sort of old infrastructure. Uh, you could look at average cost pricing, where essentially all access seekers pay the same, or you, which is the sort of standard approach in energy, or you could look at Ramsey pricing, where the most profitable end users pay more or the most profitable third parties pay more than the less profitable ones, which is the approach that's done in, in rail infrastructure, where pricing goes over and above the, the short run marginal cost. You could also think about um, uh, price differentiation by volume or, or length of contract, which is how it's done in sort of fiber networks. And then finally, the sort of most um, data holder friendly approach here would be something that was done in rail and postal in the old days, which is the so-called retail minus approach, where essentially you're making the access seeker pay for the whole cost of collecting the data minus whatever cost the data holder would have in marketing this data if it were to do the same as the access seeker. Um, that's, that approach has gotten a bit of a bad rep because it's not very good at incentivizing entry. Um, so that's, that's been a sort of super quick tour across different approaches that we can do and I'm very happy to take some of those to the the Q&A to talk a bit more about how they might work in practice or why we can't piggyback on some of the uh, other approaches where we've explicitly looked at valuing data, for example, under the GDPR or under German competition law, where you've got a new Article 19 in the, the GWB, the German Competition Act, that's uh, barring you from abuse of a dominant position with regard to data that you may have. Um, I've probably used up my my 10 minutes, so let me just uh, close very quickly. I think what's, what's good in terms of compensation in the Data Act is that for the non-competitive uh, parts of data sharing, Data Act is not too intrusive in that it allows for a lot of uh, leeway for, for negotiating good solutions 
But where it's very prescriptive, where it's probably too prescriptive, is on um, gatekeepers and government, um, where you're either giving away for free or not giving away at all, and where you may need to sharpen and become clearer on what you actually want as a, as a policymaker is really on those situations where there is competition on, in the aftermarket, where the current stipulation of reasonable compensation is probably still pretty ill-defined, but thankfully there is plenty uh, of material from, from other spaces that we can use to, to inform that as the debate progresses. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for this insightful um, views um, on a concept of reasonable compensation for, for data exchange under the draft data act. It's still a draft, we have to say and stress that, um, but uh, could be very close to what's coming um, um, soon in, from this uh, angle from the European legislator. The term reasonable, of course, is, is something which is quite uh, often used um, in, in 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 the legal practice um, and in in uh, positive uh, term terms of law. Um, very happy uh, that you have made up your mind on how to um, approach this this term in, in this respect. Um, the the legal literature uh, is 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 full, uh, and 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 so is also the case law. Uh, with respect to to other provisions calling for a reasonable compensation, like in uh, agency law, or or also from a regulatory point of view, when it comes to site sharing um, of in essential infrastructure, broadcasting infrastructure, and that kind of stuff. Very happy to 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 jump on the Q and A session on this uh, in a few minutes, and. Um, now we are uh, already approaching our last, but of course not least, uh, speaker. Um, this is <coughs> this is um, Alexandra Ebert. Alexandra uh, is um, at Responsible AI Synthetic Data and Privacy Expert um, at um, Mostly AI, as the company is called, so mostly artificial intelligence. Um, she holds the position as a chief trust officer, which is which is uh, maybe one of, uh, of of the most interesting job uh, titles that I've come across uh, in in recent days. One of the the ones I like uh, also most, I have to say, the chief trust officer in a, a field which is uh, particularly depending, I guess, um, on on trust. It's when it comes to artificial intelligence. And um, today she will speak on why synthetic data is essential for responsible AI, data democratization and fairness. A very um, broad uh, topic um, and I will be uh, looking forward um, how this can fit into the 10 minutes format that um, we dedicated to Alexandra and to our other speakers. Um, Alexandra, um, by the way, is also, um, she serves as the chair of the IEEE Synthetic Data IC Expert Group um, and is uh, passionate about ethical AI and ensuring the way fair and responsible use of, of machine learning algorithms. Uh, she's also a co-author of a, a very renowned ICLR paper and a popular blog series uh, on these uh, topics. Now, um, really uh, handing over to Alexander Ebert and the topic on why synthetic data is so essential for all these new data uses um, coming up. Thank you very much, Roland, for this uh, nice and also very extensive uh, introduction. I must say it's not only a cool job title, it's also a really cool job because I get to work on all these very interesting and timely topics surrounding privacy and the ethical use of artificial intelligence. So coming to my talk today, I would actually argue that the future of sustain sustainable data needs open data and data democratization. Why am I saying that? 
Well, if we look at the goals of the European Union, that they want to become a global responsible leader in artificial intelligence and want to empower not only the big players, but also small and medium enterprises to build, develop and benefit from this new data and AI ecosystem, then this is not going to happen if only a few companies have access to this new oil, as we already heard data being described today. So, Mark, uh, Roland Mark, you said it in the beginning, we're not talking only about personal data, but whenever we talk about personal data and openly sharing the data, I would assume that a few red flags pop up with the legal audience that we have here, assumingly today, because, of course, GDPR isn't a big fan of uh, openly sharing privacy sensitive data. So privacy could be an issue to opening up data and data democratization. But it's not only privacy that we need to care about. If you really want to think also of the ethical news, which is another topic of today's webinar, then it's also important to think of aspects how this data could actually aid in the development of ethical, responsible technology and particularly artificial intelligence. And synthetic data is a technology that can help with both, both fields, privacy protection and unlocking access to sensitive data assets, as well as responsible AI and particularly CMS. So in my remaining eight minutes, I want to talk about what synthetic data is, how it helps with privacy and unlocking access to data and data democratization, and then share a little bit about synthetic data in the context of responsible AI, since this is a super broad field that will focus on CMS. Um, what is synthetic data? So the Joint Research Center of the European Commission actually uh, just published a report recently where they stated that uh, according to their point of view, synthetic data is going to become the key enabler for artificial intelligence in Europe, both for business as well as for policy applications. And it's also technology that's already used by eight out of the largest 10 US banks at the moment. You can think of synthetic data as an anonymization technology. Basically, it helps you to replicate your existing privacy-sensitive data assets in a way that you don't use utility while making sure that this data can't be re-identified. I think to understand why this is such a paradigm shift in the uh, way of data anonymization, I'll first focus on why synthetic data is needed. And the reason for that is, on the one hand, that we want to make use of all the data that we have collected as an organization, but at the same time, of course, we want to comply with GDPR and we want to make sure that the privacy of our customers remains safely protected. With traditional anonymization techniques, unfortunately, like masking, like obfuscation, the problem is that those technologies were developed in an era of small data. So back then, when organizations collected your demographic information, your zip code, your social security number, and some information like that. Back then, in that time, traditional anonymization worked fine. The problem that researchers have identified in dozens and dozens of papers over the last decades is that these method methodologies actually are not fit for purpose in the era of big data anymore. Why is that? Well, with behavioral data, so the time at which you purchase your coffee at Starbucks, or hopefully not at Starbucks because you have better options here in Vienna, or uh, the time you, I don't know, shop something on Amazon, is already a behavioral data point. And if you take a few of them together, then you suddenly have something that becomes super unique to you. You can describe it as your digital fingerprint. And with traditional anonymization techniques, the problem is that they try to just delete, mask or obfuscate those bits and pieces of the data that somebody deems to be re-identified. So let's say your social security number or your address or something like that. And researchers have identified that regardless how much information you delete, even if you leave only two or three data points out of the 300, 500,000, 10,000 data points that organizations nowadays collect about their consumers intact, this is already an attack surface that, in addition with some publicly available information on Facebook or something like that, could lead to re-identification. So with traditional anonymization, you have two problems. One, it's absolutely not safe anymore and doesn't fulfill the standards that we have in GDPR Recital 26 about what anonymization, uh, anonymous data actually should consist out of. The second problem, if we think about data-driven innovation, if we think about AI, which is particularly data-hungry, is that it is a destructive approach, destroys the utility of your data set. And as research has demonstrated that, for example, already three credit card transactions per customer out of the dozens or hundred credit card transactions you maybe do every year are sufficient to uniquely re-identify over 80% of your customers, you can see that with three transactions, 
you don't really have that much information left that you could use for analysis or new AI development, new products, new services. So you need a good privacy protection or good utility. And this is where synthetic data comes in. Synthetic data is a sophisticated new approach to data anonymization, where you don't stick to the original data and try to mask, obfuscate certain parts and elements of it, but you just learn from the data, the patterns, the structures, the correlations, the time dependencies. To say it simple, basically how your customers interact and how they behave. And once this is learned, by the way, by deep learning algorithm, this knowledge can be used to generate new synthetic artificial customers. And let's say they're synthetic financial transactions or the synthetic medical records. And if you look on these two data sets, your real privacy sensitive data and the fully anonymous synthetic data, from a statistical point, they're nearly indistinguishable. You will get the same results if you develop AI on that versus on that data set. But from a privacy point of view, you're significantly different. Personal data, anonymous data, free to share, free to use, free uh, to also put openly on your website and let others benefit on it. So that's the concept of synthetic data. How can this help with data democratization and ensuring broader access to data? Well, our customers, mainly large organizations in the financial services industry, insurance, medical, healthcare, and also public sector, use this technology to give a broader group of their innovative people, their employees, access to data because it's still useful for AI training, product development, uh, software testing, but it's privacy safe. So they use it to democratize access internally, but not only internally, synthetic data is fully anonymous and can safely be shared. So we have also several organizations who use it to collaborate with startups, AI vendors, make use of cloud services when they have internal policies that prohibit them from using production data in the cloud. Or even some other customers, like the fourth largest health insurance, Humana, who said, well, we want to give back, we want to give researchers access to this valuable healthcare data that we have. And they last year opened up their synthetic data and a sample of their customer base, super granular, completely privacy safe data on their website. And this is, I think, an important step with synthetic data that you can break out of the silos of data and break out of, of this old paradigm where only a few privileged individuals had, had access to data and can really open up data internally and if you want to, even beyond the borders of your organization. And that access to data, I think, is really fundamental to enable fewer innovation in that space. Since I don't have that much time left, I'll come to the second part. Beyond privacy, synthetic data can also contribute to responsible AI, particularly AI fairness. Why is that? Well, if you have traditional anonymization and only leave, let's say, the average chain and John Doe intact, because every outlier would be too privacy sensitive, then it's difficult to really understand the full spectrum of human diversity, the different needs of different population groups of different individuals. With synthetic data, you would never get sensitive information about single individuals or a handful of individuals, but you can get much more granular and therefore get access to behavioral data and also to demographic attributes that are much needed in the development of fair algorithms to understand, is my algorithm actually discriminatory or not? Not sure if you know that, but actually there was some research done by Microsoft Research and a few other researchers where they asked leading AI fairness practitioners what their biggest challenge is to make sure that the algorithms they develop do not discriminate. And the answer was that it's really the access to sensitive attributes because many privacy laws and anti-discrimination laws prohibit them from using this information from real people. So with synthetic data, there could be a privacy safe way to introduce this information in the development process and make sure that while you develop the algorithm, your algorithm is truly colorblind or genderblind, for example. But there are many other ways how synthetic data can contribute. One important aspect again here is data democratization, increasing diversity and inclusion. Since data becomes freely shareable, it's much easier for organizations to have many pairs of eyes look at this data and find out if there are some biases that need to be taken uh, care of, or even shared with external AI auditors, for example. There's also in the European Union and uh, also in the UK some suggestions in regards to AI assurance, where services that help organizations to develop responsible and fair AI should be made available. For example, also AI bias audits. 
And here again, synthetic data will be a super important puzzle piece because it's impossible for a human auditor of an algorithm to just look at the code of an AI system and then give you a stamp and tell you, well, that's not going to discriminate. The person really needs granular representative or even over-representative data that has plenty of examples of minority groups and outliers and rare scenarios like, for example, with our healthcare customer, Humana, Native American woman of a certain age with a certain medical condition. In the real data, there's just very, very little data about that. With synthetic data, they can make sure that they have more examples that then can be used to test the system. So it's AI audits, and it's also in the context of fair synthetic data, the capability to not only statistically create a replica of your data, as it's the case with the normal synthetic data generation process, but the capability to generate fair synthetic data. So basically to say you have a historically biased data set where there's a female-male gender pay gap or something like that, and tell the algorithm that this should be corrected according to a given mathematical fairness definition that could be defined by a regulator or even the internal AI guidelines and principles of an organization. And with that, it becomes possible to generate data that reflects the world not as it is and with all of our historic biases, but as we or as a regulator would like it to be. And this is also one step that could help with AI fairness. As mentioned, it's a super broad topic. And since I'm running out of time, there are actually two things I want to leave you with. So synthetic data can help with privacy and responsible AI. In the context of privacy, it's much more the silver bullet solution when you want to anonymize data. You don't need to do anything else. In the context of fairness, though, which is much more difficult, much more complex, it's just a tool that can contribute. But fairness and ethical AI is really something that needs to be taken into account right from the very beginning when you think about developing AI throughout the whole development and deployment life cycle. So I'm stopping here and I'm very much looking forward to our q and round. Perfectly uh, on time, um, Alexander. I tried, I tried. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this was very informative. And as a data protection lawyer um, who um, often um, has to flag um, some data protection issues to, to, to clients if they proceed in a way uh, uh, in, in using data which might uh, not be um, yeah, fully fully in line with with GDPR anymore. It is very helpful um, to hear that there is a way out, um, uh, a way to enable um, data analysis, uh, maybe even in a big data context or uh, in an AI context, by um, synthesizing um, data out of a given set of personal data, and so to say. Um, get it out of the uh, area of application of the uh, GDPR actually um, into another world here yeah, um, um, where they have an afterlife uh, and, and they even provide for the same uh, insights into the intelligence that uh, you can uh, draw out of, of, of data. Uh, thank you very much um, to, to all the presenters so far. I think we, we really uh, um, spent um, um, a lot of, of topics, um, starting with uh, big players um, sitting uh, on, 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 on data, so to say, with uh, um, data-driven monopolies, oligopolies, um, uh, data sharing concepts uh, in a new, uh, in a new um, uh, data marketplace um, to be set up um, under the Gaia-X. Um, domain um, about compensating data holders uh, uh, in return for sharing the data, um, about using data um, in um, a synthesized way to get um, privacy-friendly intelligence, and uh, lastly, um, how all this could fit together in democratization um, approaches um, to this new oil, as, as other speakers mentioned, that data is all about. Um, I'm very happy uh, that the four uh, topics fit uh, together so well, uh, as it turned out, and now I'm very much looking forward to um, questions of the, of the attendees that they may have. Um, so please um, feel free to, to chat. Um, 
and, and provide us with your uh, questions. While you are still typing in your questions, maybe I, I can use the, the, the time um, to ask uh, Helmut uh, from GaiaX. Um, uh, I understand it's not an open uh, uh, data initiative uh, as, as many, many before, um, but a new concept. Um, uh, do, do you also feel that uh, a data localization obligation would be a necessary enabler of this concept, or are we um, still free to um, keep and store the data wherever we want uh, in, a, in a global data uh, environment, so to say? Or, or, or should, we, should we limit ourselves to keeping data within the boundaries of the European Union? I mean, a um, very essential question, but, and it goes directly into the heart of the whole idea of GAIX. Um, let me try with some other words and based on example to underline and explain again what I tried in a principal way to explain what GAIAX is. Basically, the approach, we should, we should get rid of the last 30 years of developing IT and the way how we data use today is, from my point of view, still very old. So we take data, we store it somewhere, and if it's somewhere stored, everybody can do with it every, what he wants. We can do thousands of copies, you have no control. Data is there as plain text, and that's the problem. In the new world, think about uh, combining data with algorithms. So I can share with you a data set, and you get the allowance only to use the data one time for one specific reason. And then a technical platform ensures that you cannot use it as a twice, a second time for some for somebody for some other means. So that's one of the key issues of the data protection ideas. So the idea of GAIX as well is for the moment we are just working to be sure and uh, to be honest in the GAIX context, mainly the industry is working on it uh, in the industri industry domain where we don't have personal relevant data. So the main actors are currently the automotive industry. Just to give you an, an example, here we're talking about the data marketplace of actors. So there are roughly 250,000 stakeholders, legal entities in the whole data market for the automotive supply in the automotive supply chain industry. It's a huge, enormous amount of, of actors. And now that everybody is in this marketplace and a supplier of a small piece has suddenly access to a data set of some other supplier, which he didn't, doesn't even know, that's the idea of the marketplace, so that new actors are coming together. That's, that's, that's one element. The second element is if data is exchanged, the business constraints, the legal constraints, and now pointing to your question, if I request for my data, it has only to be stored at this location, I can specify it somehow, and by technical means is ensured. And if somebody else is using the data without talking to me in complex contracts, in machine readable form, this information is attached to the data. And then the system again ensures that nobody in, no stakeholder in the whole marketplace is able to use the data in his, in his storage location. So in principle, to answer your question, yes, that's the idea, a specification how to treat or how the data should be dealt with. And this specification is even by technical means ensured. And this will open a complete new way of solving some of the big problems which you have with the Data Act and all our uh, legal regime and, and policies just by a new platform of how to use data. And this will, will be somehow disruptive, I think. Very interesting. So a sort of a digital rights management system, but uh, in the context of, of, of data. Um, no, thank you very much. Um, the, the price, by the way, um, would it be the uh, sort of a compens uh, and an and, and equitable, uh, reasonable uh, compensation like uh, Dominic uh, Hübler uh, was talking about in the in, in the context from uh, data subject to data controller, or will it be um, a, like on any other marketplace something that the parties agree on in advance, or or is it also on an open? No, a very good point. Yeah, I did not uh, detail this uh, far enough. So, since this is a very crucial 
vision with a huge amount of work to be done. It's not easy, it's very complex. I would say nobody in Europe, can, no big player, no industry, there is not enough funding or, or R&D capacity available. Any actor can do it on its own. That's the reason why a community was built. So for the moment, many big players, for the moment it's the automotive industry, many stakeholders are there investing to a strategic investment. National organizations or national states and the European Commission is funding it together. So for the moment, the idea is we implement some of those solutions, which I tried to explain, and open it and, and provide it to the market as an open source. So that's the open aspect. So some, many actors are currently investing and implementing and providing it as an open source that the market is enabled and the, and the quicker uh, transformation time, uh, take up time, a shorter take up time is happening. So something happened in the market. So that's the open source idea of the solution. So for the moment, uh, in spring next year, there will be a, a bunch of open source uh, software modules available, which companies can just use for free. That's the open source. But the business model, what do you, when I share my data, for example, with you for some business ideas, or I provide it to a business market, it should be the free market. The data has a value and I want to sell it, or I want to uh, sell it to somebody with some legal and commercial rights and commercial uh, models behind. So there is no kind of just cost orientation, just open source for free. No, it's, it should be the implementation of a business model. Very interesting. And thank you for pointing out this, this out in, in, in addition to, to that. Um, we received an answer from, from the audience, which is directed, I would say, uh, primarily to, to Dominic. Um, as he mentioned, case law regarding reasonable fees and, and prices. Um, and the question actually is, do you feel national courts have sufficient guidance here or should legislation try to be more precise and offer more guidance? I assume, as opposed to saying it should be reasonable yeah, uh, on how to determine the right level and, and amount. Dominic. Yes, yeah, so I think it's it's too late. You can also switch on your, your video, I don't know. Yeah, perfect. So my video is on, I don't know why it's not yeah, yeah. I'm still here, I'll be the voice from the off. Um, uh, I think this has two elements, and I'll cover the economic one and then play it back to you to, to think a bit about the, the legal one. I mean, in terms of economics, the idea of the, of the Data Act and the idea of all sorts of European legislation is to try and create a, a common European market. So to the extent that you are um, delegating the interpretation of what's reasonable and what's not to local courts to govern what are essentially pan-European services, I think you are cre creating an excess amount of, of transaction costs because as a regulated entity, as a, as a company that's operating across markets, you may end up finding that your pricing scheme in Spain is acceptable to the Spanish uh, courts. But if you try and do the same pricing scheme in Austria, it's not acceptable. And then you have the question, given that data is essentially pretty easily moved across borders, should you just move your entire data operation to Spain and just have Austrian customers buy from Spain in that case. So I think, as I, as I mentioned during my talk, then there's certainly something to be said for something that is as European and as easily moved as data to give more guidance to local courts rather than have local courts or local sort of dispute resolution centers. I guess it's not even clear whether these will be courts. Um, second guess and come up with their own ideas um but very happy to also hear your, your lawyer's view on this so no no clear yes or no i i i, I uh, at least this is how i understood it uh, do we need a sort of a regulator or an arbitral a body or whatever to um to decide on what is reasonable what is what this makes sense uh, from from your point of view so I think 
we should have more sort of common European guidance. If, if the idea is that every country sets up their own dispute resolution centre, then either we're going to waste a number of years by each of these dispute resolution centres coming up with their own ideas or sort of just staying proceedings and asking the ECJ, much in the ways we've seen uh, with the GDPR damage cases or could we have a bit more guidance in in the european regulation on on how what we want people to to take into account um, and then it, it becomes a bit clearer i mean possibly one step in this direction and i mentioned early on when i was giving this example about what's the product the car or the, the parts or the repair shop there is a specific European regulation on uh, on the car, the vehicle aftermarket, and that is providing a little bit more guidance than just fair and reasonable by also making a point about um, the fact that it shouldn't deter new entrants. Um, the European Court of Justice then kicked this idea back to the local courts. And now local courts need to come up with the idea of what is uh, what is deterrent behaviour and what's not. And there's always going to be an element of that. But if we just have this one word of reasonable um, in, in the European Data Act here for the vast majority of the cases, and then some very specific guidance on some smaller things like uh, small and medium enterprises and governments and emergencies, then I think that's probably providing detail where it's less necessary and not providing enough detail where some more detail would be helpful just from a sort of commercial perspective of how do I do I actually set up my my pricing scheme. Thank you. So so more guidance um, um, yeah desirable so to say from from, uh, from the European Policymakers, yeah, to put it that way, maybe. Yeah. Um, please um, feel free to to provide us with further questions. Um, I would be asking in this context, maybe also um, Alexandra. I mean, if I understand your service correctly, then you are adding value to a certain set of data because um, once it's synthesized. Um, um, the, the data holder can act freely and, and draw intelligence out of it. Would you, in this, um, in this, in this concept, also claim a, a, an, a reasonable compensation for making data more accessible and more um, free to use, so to say, or is it, is it just... Um, is it well, I, I don't want to say something where my sales team is going to haunt, haunt me for the next coming years, but in our usual setup, no. So we are not a data processor, but we most often provide our solution to our banking clients, to our insurance clients, because the sensitive personal data they have, they don't want to give out of their hands. So they actually use this on their premise, on their cloud environment to perform the job themselves. Therefore, uh, I think we wouldn't fall into that category. Perfect. So, um, um, even though data is anonymized um, as, as one part of the synthesization process, I guess, um, the original data holder remains the owner. Paulina, would you, would you agree uh, with your, the concepts on data ownership that you developed in this respect? Or is it, is it a, a new set of data that is there and it's solely economically um, assigned to the original holder? Um, well, what do you mean with original holder? <laughs> is it well? Is it the manufacturer or is it the, the bank, producer? the insurance company, as we heard? Mm -hmm. um, well, I believe so. Yeah, actually, <laughs> and that's why the 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 uh, provisions are like they are drafted in the in the draft act, uh, data act. Uh, meaning that exactly those holders uh, shall give um, other uh, persons, the users, um, and, and and other market participants access to them. So, 
in essence, um, yeah, the, 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 the definition of ownership is uh, simply uh, maybe not <laughs> in a strict legal sense as we would see, but uh, simply connected to the possession, yes, as a holder, uh, I believe so. Maybe if I also may add to that, I think one of the more interesting cases would also be scenarios like the planned European data hubs or data spaces where you or where it's currently being discussed that, of course, you could get data from different organizations and then there's a possibility to combine all of those data sets into one new data set. And here again, the question is then, okay, if I don't know, a large organization organization contributed 80% of the data and another organization only 20%, how do you continue uh, to, to allocate the kind of uh, value that was generated on innovations made out of this data? So I think that's one point. And um, one other thing that we've also heard quite often in the industry is that one thing that's missing for them are the incentives or obligations to share the data. And then, of course, also this uncertainty. If you pool data together, how can you make sure the different players in the value chain get compensated fairly? And what would be the compensation in that sense? Thank you very much. Um, no further uh, questions from, from the audience. So if, if also the speakers want to ask questions to themselves and to some sort of cross-examination, yeah, but just if you, if, if you like to. So I take the floor, if you allow. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> just referring to the last comment, um, which I want to underline again, um, because the keyword was data pooling and combining and, and business model. Um, coming, of course, I'm representing the data guy X idea. So, um, in the whole concept, it should be clear that the data will, in this guy X, so new sharing, new way of sharing data concept, the data should stay as it is. So, it stays there as it is in my cellar, on my server, somewhere in the cloud, it's there as it is there. There's no change, only the mechanism how to find the data and then to combine it. So this kind of data matching and data sharing process and also the data business model exchange process, who is paying whom for what, this is now built on a new, call it a software middle, middleware above this data storage areas. And in all these, in this context, um, the way of combining data, allowing it for somebody else to apply an algorithm on the data and then I get it back or somebody else get it back. This mechanism is controlled and for the moment we don't have any kind of means then just provide it to somebody which does, does everything in his data combined with algorithm mode. That These are the big cloud providers for the moment. And to create a new, enable new market actors which are capable of being competitive to this big cloud providers in managing the data, not storing the data. The storage of data is a different discussion. That's the idea of, of GAIAX, which Europe uh, is striving for it now. Just to better understand how much is the intention of GAIAX also to provide all these different kind of pre-trained models and uh, different AI ML services that are currently being used at, I don't know, AWS. Um, compute, Azure. Sure. So the X has a has a meaning. The X means, and there's, if you look now in the X presentation, you always see the uh, below or two levels of the X is the service provisioning. Exactly, there are new means of how to deal with data. So there are the algorithms. So I'm, I have some. I can. So just for example, we are providing currently. I try to provide as in my AIT role a day data matching mechanisms where data is encrypted and the encrypted data is used for matching the data. So there is no real data seen and understand by anybody in this marketplace. It have, so algorithm is applied to the data and this is for the marketplace. So if somebody wants to use this feature, you can use it. He uh, applies it to his data and something happens to it. And on the buff, there are the data users which are then using data and algorithms. So that's the idea. But don't forget for the moment we have visions and many, we call it lighthouse projects, which are implementing it now for different use cases and different applications, the usage of the data, but also the algorithms. It's not yet a ready solution. It's a strategy which has started now just recently, two years ago, and there's a strong momentum in it. I mean, principally, yes.
Did I just catch this correctly that you said, well, the data would be joined in an encrypted form and the actual use of the platform would never be able to see the data? Exactly. So that's one example of one example of having a marketplace where data matching can happen, but all the actors don't see the data. Of course, if I then use the data, I want to exchange it with somebody. So for example, call it like a uh, we call it an already like a dating app for machines. If you're then exchanging the data for a business model, of course, then you have to trans uh, transfer it again between the two business partners. But on the marketplace, it's not visible. And the technology is already out there. You can do the matching, uh, for example, of data in an encrypted mechanism. It's not, not yet used for it. But yes. But still, it would be possible via the marketplace to make use of this data to develop an AI solution. For example, yeah. If that's, that's the, the case, uh, I think particularly in the coming years, my concern would be that it's crucial to have access to at least granular data. It doesn't have to be the real data. As mentioned, synthetic data could be a replacement. But particularly coming from the corner of responsible AI, fairness, and so on, it would be terribly hard to assess the data and really get a comprehensive view whether you need to add some data, what is actually collected there, if you never get access to it. So I could envision something like that working super fine in a few years' time, when also this nascent field of how to actually build models that are fair by design has progressed and we have different tools and mechanisms that help us to automate this. But I think in this early stage, it's super important that access to granular data is granted to also um, um, provide this kind of uh, human involvement, human oversight. That's, I think, a central piece of yeah. many of the regulations we've seen coming. Full agreement, yeah. Perfect, perfect to see that there is there are already two market players represented from this panel, yeah, which are in full agreement um, over these uh, very um, complex uh, topics that we uh, actually talked about today. Um, my personal perception is that we are, um, as, as a lawyer, our focus was in the recent years on, on GDPR. We are now approaching, uh, so to say, a, a little bit of a post-GDPR area where um, um, of course, um, data protection is is, is still uh, one of the, the utmost um, important uh, targets. But the the free, the reasonable, and non-discriminatory um, access to all sorts of data, yeah, as an enabler for the economy, is um, more important than ever. And all of uh, you speakers um, um, really stated their views um, on, on how to enable uh, this bright um, future, hopefully, for all of us in an environment where data can be reasonably used. And uh, this is a, a perfect reference also to the uh, heading of, of this webinar, the, the sustainable use of, of data. So being um, cautious of time, um, I may extend a big thank you um, to um, all our speakers um, and all participants also for, for sharing your know-how and, and contributing to the both as the future of series. Um, I'm sure there will be plenty of um, discussion points that we can take up uh, also individually after, after this very insightful session. And so all the participants are, if you're interested in further insights into what's the future uh, uh, in more general might look like, please register for our next event on the future of DeFi, which is uh, decentralized financing, not, not HiFi. DeFi, um, this is taking place uh, at the end of January, on the 31st January next year. It would be hosted by my dear uh, tax partner, Niklas Schmidt. The invitation will be sent out soon and um, it's now on me to thank you all for, for listening and, and watching and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.